Hi. <clears throat> These guys have been in the news recently, haven't they? So um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think there was a headline, Hall suing Oates. And not just suing him, also there was a restraining order. And a lot of people kind of initially like, what? What the hell is going on? Maybe Oates attacked Hall. Uh, but, I mean, some uh, lawyers, I saw lawyers commenting on these like discussion threads or underneath news stories here. Well, actually, a restraining order doesn't always have to mean a physical restraining order. It can mean like a restraint of business uh, action or something, you know, like suing, uh, signing a contract or something like that or, or pursuing a whatever you're going to do with it with your part of a business. And so it came out that that's what it was. From memory, it was um, Hall, no, sorry, Oates, John Oates, who was that guy there, the guy with the moustache. The, I guess the kind of more of the, the lesser of the two, at least in the, in the eyes of the public. He wanted to sell his side, <clears throat> side of the partnership um, to one of those kind of uh, private equity firms that kind of nowadays is going around buying up publishing rights to, to different musicians, catalogs, and, um, you know, because these guys are getting on now, and I guess they'd rather kind of cash out the money as opposed to have the ongoing royalties that might be better if you're younger. Um, and Hall stepped in, Daryl Hall, and he said, hey, I don't want you to do that. Now, there might be more to it, um, but I think it's it's that's what's going on. Now, if you've followed Hall and Oates in any way and kind of heard their, um, their interviews, they kind of uh, say a similar thing about the partnership. So th these guys have been together since, I think, about the late 60s, or at least I think their, f their first album, which was Hall Oates, came out in 72. I think 70, 72. And so that's what 50 some years coming. My math's not good. Yes. 50 years. I'm right. It's, uh, it's over 50 years and it's, um, any partnership of that long is going to have friction and creative partnerships, especially. And so they've gone on the record as saying that, They've had difficulty in their relationship, creative differences, and they maybe don't really consider each other friends, but they are partners. And actually, I, when, the, when this all came out a couple of weeks ago, I, I actually um, was watching some old interviews. And there's one interview that Hall, Daryl Hall did with Howard Stern. And this would have been about 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And as Howard Stern does, he was trying to get him he was trying to kind of he was kind of baiting him into saying something bad about Oates, and um, and Hall wasn't having any of it. He he was like, he said, you know, he's he's as responsible for as for some a lot of the big hits as I am, and uh, we're like brothers. However, brothers sometimes argue. And my point is, he didn't say anything negative about it. He, as, as much as Howard Stern was trying to push him into saying something negative about his partner, uh, he he really didn't, and he kind of praised him. Um, and again, when all this came out a couple of weeks ago, this whole news story of this of the suing in the court case, I saw a lot of discussion about people saying that Daryl Hall was a prima donna and a prick. Uh, which I think is a bit unfair. I've always thought he kind of comes across okay. He seems like he seems like he's a kind of like a guy who loves music, and you know, I think anyone like they were kind of the the top of the top for a period there in the eighties. And when you're that successful and you've sold that many records and you're that rich, it's kind of hard to stay completely down on down to earth or you know not have certain kind of uh diva inclinations um but i think some people have been, been a little bit unfair to to daryl hall 
and kind of portraying Oates as the victim in all this. <laughs> I uh, I love their music. Um, I you know I like it. Oh, not like everyone, but like like most people, their their eighties heyday is the stuff that I love. The the seventies stuff I could kind of take or leave. Um, you can. I haven't listened to a whole lot of their back catalogue from the seventies. I kind of I think I went through a period. I went through a period about nine years ago where I really got into them, really listened to everything from the beginning to the end, and um, read a lot about them. And I was to the point where I was almost not almost, but it was kind of like I was playing with the idea of going to see them. They were on tour at the time. They were touring the US and they had a show in Hawaii and I was living in South Korea and I thought just the idea of going to Hawaii and seeing Hall and Oates live in concert in Hawaii, it just sounded so cool. But I didn't do it in the end because it would have cost thousands and thousands of dollars and actually at that time I probably could have afforded it. This was pre-child. <laughs> I think it was when my, me and my wife were first got married and we had... um. Not like money to burn, but certainly when you're both working, as we both were full time jobs and um, living in South Korea, which is a pretty cheap country to live in, um, especially rental wise, you know, the rents are very well, it might have changed in the last hour long, but it was very cheap there. And we didn't have a kid, so you you know, childcare costs, so you know, you're um. You find yourself with a lot more money to, to, to do things that you want to do in, the, in those situations. And um, the idea of taking a, a week long uh, trip to Hawaii to see Hall Notes in concert wasn't something that would be completely unimaginable as it would be right now. I own two of their albums, or not two, two CDs. Uh, I would like to get more of their stuff, but very rarely do I see any albums of theirs around on CD. Very rarely. Almost never. So I've got a double disc um, best of. So this was bought second hand. You can see it's got the postcode D. I got this in 2000 and I think 2014, just while I was talking about it, I was kind of going through a, my first period of really getting into them. And um, it's a double disc and it has uh, 18 tracks per disc. So what's that? 36 songs and it has everything you would imagine it having it's not chronological it tends more towards the 80s early 80s mid 80s stuff as you would imagine um you can can you read that the black doesn't really shop on the red very well does it man eater rich girl kiss summer and liz private eye method of modern love every song you would expect to be on there is is and then some um so yeah it's a pretty pretty good best of um this one here i picked up more recently for 50 cents or a dollar or 50 cents and i remember when i got this i didn't know what it was because it doesn't kind of give you any clues it's got some more modern photos but it looks i don't know just looks like it's one of those off-brand uh compilations and it is what this is is a recording of the stuff they did pre whole oats this is like almost like kind of like demos that they did uh before they signed with a major label i think they signed with atlantic is it atlantic it's not going to say on there is it oh, they probably changed a few times i'm pretty sure their first record label was atlantic and um and this is the stuff they did before they were with atlantic some of the songs on here made it onto what's um Fallen Philadelphia. If that makes you happy and they need each other, I'm pretty sure those have been featured on some of their early albums. But the thing is, when you listen to this, this sounds like it was recorded off AM radio. It has a very, uh, very, very, very dated sound to it. The songs aren't particularly good or bad. Um, but it just, yeah, it sounds really, more than almost any recorded album I've heard before, 
just yeah so really low quality and it has this this like i said am radio like you know when you listen to music on am radio it loses however much of its um frequency and tones all over the place because it's coming through am well that's what it sounds like and i guess it was like i said they kind of maybe recorded this cheaply and were shopping it around different um record companies to try and get a record deal i guess that's the idea of this and then later on someone got the rights to this and then they put it out and this is put out by some cheapo never heard of before uh, here we are shanghai music and this was released in 94 so you know some 20 some years after it was originally originally done and as always it's always a big clue with uh these off-brand compilations in no liner notes it's just a single leaf with nothing much on it at all um so yeah I, yeah, I, I would say I'm a, I'm a big fan of Hall of Notes. There's something about their music that really captures a feeling. And a lot of people say, uh, and it's kind of come back around more recently, they've kind of become cool again in a certain way. But there was a period there where Hall of Notes were kind of among the, the most uncool, cheesy music you can imagine. I remember when I was working overseas, anyway, I knew a guy who liked Hall of Notes and everyone used to give him shit about it. And I was reading this, this guy went through the whole album catalog and was reviewing each album one by one. <laughs> when he got to, what's the one that he did? Uh, the one that's Out of Touch is on. Hang on. The big band boom or what it's called. Um, the one after H2O. I'm talking while looking. I'll pause. Yeah, there's Big Bang Boom. He was talking about Big Bang Boom. And I think Myth of Modern Lovers on Big Bang Boom. And it's just, I always remember the review. He said, I can't imagine anyone, <laughs> I can't imagine anyone listening to this song, Method of Modern Love, and not feeling embarrassed, which I thought was quite harsh, but also quite funny. And I can understand why he's saying that. But I love that song. It is very 80s, dated 80s sound and cheesy and almost a little bit silly. And if you watch the video as well, it's even more silly. But like I said, there's something about, maybe it's the, the, the quality of Daryl Hall's voice. There's something that they capture that for me is unlike any other band. And it's like this, truly uh i'm gonna say optimistic or um not fun i can't yeah see i can't put my finger on what it is but it's like this kind of mood this feeling the music gives me that they seem to get between the years of about 1979 and 1985 that um everything they released around there kind of captures that feeling and um it's it's an overwhelmingly positive feeling. It's not like positive, like the music makes me feel positive. I don't, I don't even mean like that. It's just that's the only word I can really directly connect to what the feeling that I'm trying to get across. So I can understand why many people would think it's cheesy shit. Um, and as like I said, embarrassing, but I absolutely love Hall of Notes, especially from that period. From... Um, What's it doing? Ecstatic voices, private eyes, private eyes is a brilliant album. H two O, big bam boom, and even some of the earlier stuff. Which one was Sarah Smiles? Sarah Smiles. That was on the self titled one, Daryl Hall and John Notes, I think. Yes, the one where they're wearing like makeup, black and white photo, and <laughs> Hotz in particular has got this like really red patch or looks red of uh, rouge on his cheeks. Um. Anyway, so yeah, that's all I have on the way of Hall of Notes. For a band I love a lot, I only have two things. But like I said, it's, you, I don't think I've ever seen a copy of Private Eyes on CD in New Zealand. Um, but I'm sure eventually I'll find something and uh, I'll pick it up when I do. Anyway, thanks for watching.